This is the Lydia and Spin with Lydia Lunch and uh, Timothy Dow. Hi, Tim. How you doing? I'm uh, in Gloucester, Massachusetts, visiting the fam. I'm in, and... I'm in Berlin with Vanya, also my fam. Oh, yes. <laughs> just cool. Ar- just yeah. arrived, yep. And uh, doing my show Friday night at the Beth B. Exhibition at the Crematorium at Silent Green. So, mm. No, that sounds fun. Uh, we just, uh, Dominica just shucked some raw oysters and we wolf those fucking things down and uh now uh i'm gonna go to dinner with the mom soon and uh i guess we're gonna do this first we're gonna uh tell each other our intro stories our intros exactly here we go well i mean yes now we've all seen by now the fact that an octopus can open a jar did you know that bees work in conjunction and can actually open, there's a video of this, a soda bottle. I guess it was Fanta. They were after it. So, you know. What? What? How's so, that do you remember? Do you remember I had mentioned before that I think it was China that was trying to ta- tra- uh, train bees to sniff out COVID? As yes. well as squirrels. Yes. As well as squirrels. Well, anyway, uh, bees, I mean, a packed brain of a bee can be connected with as many as a hundred thousand different cells. So anyway, bees <laughs> uh, are pretty amazing. We have to protect them, of course, and they have been known to work in conjunction to open a soda bottle. Just I mean, to I mean, uh, I, I hate to admit this, but sometimes I struggle opening a soda bottle. I, I mean, struggle to open. It. <laughs> I, mean, I don't even. Sometimes they're on there; they're so tight and. and and, and, and but like, so I don't understand. So they, they kind of cluster okay, together. Okay, but doing simple addition and turning a screw on cap are completely different problems. So how do these insects manage that? Well, they fail when they face any unsimilar task. But unscrewing a bottle cap is not a task evolution of bees were ever accounted for. But they may have been simply lucky in this case. They detected something sweet, and whatever they tried sure. seemed to work. And the cap was screwed on quite tightly but you know i mean it's like ants i mean they can carry what i mean 10 100 times their weight i mean we need to protect the insects and as we know so many species insects animals even humans are at a high rate of extinction right now of course humans are not becoming well, extinct 100 100 to 150 species go extinct every day and of course most of that's plants it's, but yes but yeah that's that uh, that really sucks. Um, hmm, do you want a silly story, a kind of sad story, a funny story? Well, I have a story. I have a story for you because you've mentioned bears a few times. Yes. Uh, did you hear about the bear that broke into the classroom at Peak Elementary School, located an hour south of Bakersfield, California? Yeah. Okay. And the teacher's name was Elaine Salmon. <laughs> she teaches fifth grade and according to the school's website she returned to the room and saw the bear running towards her she closed the classroom door locking her cell phone inside with the bear i went out quote i went over and back to the office closed the door locked the bear in there and then i went back to the office to call my husband at first i thought was it going to do any damage i have a brand new floor and i already have my decorations up luckily the bear only got into one of the classrooms. Earthquake emergency hit. I guess he knew there was one coming because we all know there was an earthquake recently. <laughs> oh, yes. California. But anyway, the bear was after Elaine Salmon, and it makes <laughs> sense. And again, animals smarter than you ever thought. <laughs> well, well, here's another California animal story, and it didn't really work out well for Davina, <laughs> Davina Corbin, who is... Uh, well, her corpse was found on her neighbor's porch, and they're like, "What Ouch. the hell?" Well, there's all these bites and chunks and all this stuff taken out of her flesh. Like, what the fuck's going on? Well, of course, they can determine, uh, you know, through what through the bite marks, what kind of animal it was. Well, it was domestic dogs. She was hi- right. hiking on the on Great the- Danes, right? This yes, Dane yes, 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 <laughs> yes. So she's walking on the. Who Black thinks Hawk. a Great Dane is going to attack? Well, no, no, no. It's not a. Great Danes t- tried 23 of them packing together. So, so you know, dogs will pack together. And that, that that's when they can be dangerous. Yes. 
But, but I mean, Great Danes all, in a pack, all great, chewing I know, a woman to death. All Great Danes. And um, I don't know. I still don't really understand what's going on there because they'd been, uh, people witnessed them before and were scared. They're, they're, in fact, one guy, Max Hecker, he'd been complaining to animal control for a while saying, there's a pack of fucking Great Danes out in these trails and you had to be careful. In fact, his I, don't, I, don't, I mean, Great Danes are huge. Are huge. They're huge. They're huge. They're like horses. And then, and then. I mean, if they stand up, they're about six feet tall. So, so it must've been a person that had a collection of Great Danes and let them loose. I, I, I just doesn't make sense. But 25 or 20, 23 to 25, because they th think they're looking for more of them. Great Danes. I mean, that'd be terrifying. Uh, the guy who complained said, this is his quote. What I'm saying is animal control is just as much at fault about those deaths as them dogs. People in the area have been scared of them and been talking about them. I guess now they've been um, hoarded up. I, I assume they're going to be euthanized, which is ah, it's a disaster. Um, well, a extreme disaster for Davina. I mean, I mean, it is not a way to go. I do not want to be bitten to death. Thank you very much. Maybe licked to death wouldn't be, but that would take an awful long time. Another way not to go, um, <laughs> Christopher Cassie, 56, I think this was, a, no, it wasn't in New Jersey. I don't know where it was. So he he, he was a uh, notorious snorer and his neighbor- Known started, for snoring? Well, well, his neighbor kept on threatening him because basically he lived in this like duplex and through the walls, the neighbor was just going mad, couldn't sleep because Christopher Cassie was just, he had his- personal old his own personal snorkestra let's put it that way and and basically one day the, the neighbor couldn't take it busts in through the screen and because he'd been threatening to fuck up christopher cassie like i'm gonna kill your ass you don't stop that snoring and all and and i guess christopher cassie got scared and had under his pillow some kind of military knife well in self-defense he ended up stabbing to death robert wallace who attacked him for the for the snorkestra and so now now he's christopher cassie's uh you know, he's he pleaded guilty to manslaughter. Looks like he's going to go to jail for defending himself for being attacked for yes. snoring. Um, Tim, I must say, yes, I've only heard you purr, never heard you snore, but we yeah. all do it again. Uh, every now and then, you know, well, obviously, if um, sometimes when I have a cold and then I'm, you know, trying to sleep and there's sure there's some blockage oh, yeah, there, crack nose, yeah, but yeah, yeah, that, that can happen. Or uh, every now and then, I've someone told me, oh, you're snoring last night. Like on the road, sometimes when I'm just super tired and I had some drinks, sure. that can you're happen. You're sleeping then. on the back floor of the van. You might start snorkeling a bit. Well, oh, yeah. I, 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 we I, all do it. Yeah, yeah. But what we there's one thing we don't all do, and uh -oh. I'm happy to hear this, but one of the United Kingdom's decorated nuclear-driven submarine captains has been sacked for making an X-rated video and oh, sharing wow. it with subordinate while at sea. So the unnamed okay. commander who was also responsible for the Trident II submarine launched nuclear missile array was embroiled in, a, in an illicit relationship with an underling. Yeah. So when the news first came to the attention of the British naval seniors, the captain was stripped of his position as a commander of the Vanguard class submarine and combined to a desk. The thing is, you're supposed to be watching out the nuclear missiles oh, and yes. instead... You're making, you well, know, you know, to me, look, all war is X-rated anyway. So all, but the Royal Navy <laughs> has said, all forms of unacceptable behavior are taken extremely seriously and anything which falls short of the highest standards will not be tolerated. Anybody who found culpable will be accountable for their actions. Well, I'm still waiting to see, but however, no. an, another officer working on the Vanguard class submarine was accused of being, look, you're in a submarine. You're probably going to turn into a uh, sex the, 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 These uh, the, this is a, a, a notorious problem on these nuke subs because they're going underwater for three to five months, months. at a time yeah, yeah, without yeah. even going into the surface. And there's there's a lot of homosexual sex on these things. And these guys are all charged. Well, like and and by the way, also drugs. And can you blame them? I mean, they're uh, in a it, freaking submarine. It's insane those things. I so I on the the Intrepid Museum in. Um, and New York has one of these nuke subs that 
was kind of retired, I think, in the late 70s or 80s and went in there, just kind of got a sense of those things. And of course, they you, you lose track of when day and night is and you have these, ro you, they rotate the beds. So you share a bed, but like through different, you know, different rotations. So one shift uh, wakes up and the other one takes its place. I met a guy at Billy's, a bar, a, a kid that was worked on Partially. one of these. Well, worked on one of these things. He was retired and he, he would tell me all about it. The captains, like the guy who got busted, you basically you only receive instruction. There's no back and forth because once they once you you respond to instruction once you're down there, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the your rival country military can detect where you are. So so it's only incoming info. And if they say send the nuke, you can't be like, are you sure? Like you just got to do it. You're only taking it, it. It's a I couldn't imagine that. And if you're claustrophobic, forget it. I mean, yeah. Nuke subs. It's uh, they're kind of amazing, but uh, yeah. Uh, uh, no, oh, I mean, oh, uh, one not, other point. Not interested in being in a submarine. Not interested. I mean, I have enough problems sleeping. I'm, I'm not claustrophobic, but the last place I want to be is 300 feet underwater in a nuclear submarine with horny uh, hardheads. Yeah, well, the word is. Though, well, let me think about that. Well, Maybe that's uh, not the worst place. <laughs> the word is that uh, the food is excellent. I mean, I, I, because Whoa. check it out. Because Thanks, the, the good God. It, it's the roughest kind of conditions in the military to be un underwater for like four months straight. So they they treat them pretty well. They they feed them supposedly very well. That's the word. Well, but, then they shouldn't complain about them beating off and filming it or whatever it was they did. Because what else are you going to freaking do down there? I mean, you can only put your eye away from the finger on the head of a bomb for so long without wanting to it is, jerk off into the unit. Well, you know, you know they, they say this when you're touring, you know, if you're not getting any action to make sure you masturbate you know just to make just calm the well, nerves and the thing and, and, is, and, i just read a report that said men should actually be masturbating about seven times a week if they want to prevent <laughs> prostate cancer and i'm willing oh, to help some of my i'm willing <laughs> to help some of my fellow musicians out but getting line motherfuckers <laughs> the line is long well but the, i do have two hands and you know i'm generous that's well that's the, th that's the thing that these are such tight quarters in those submarines and and where, where are people who are finding places to masturbate unless it's in front of people, I, I, under I the cover, else. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Unless it's in front of somebody, it, it's basically a giant submarine circle jerk on a daily. You know, basis and if I sense. right, and I feel that if more men had homoerotic experiences, maybe they'd be less uptight and maybe less inclined to just want to blow everything else up. If they blew themselves off or blew each other, maybe they'd be less likely to want to blow up the whole fucking planet. I always felt that look. I'd rather have a president <laughs> in the White House that doesn't mind getting a blowjob or two than one that wants to blow up the whole fucking world, yeah. or one that probably has a mushroom dick and has to pay a porn star just to <laughs> you know rub up against it. I'm just let have a. I'm I, just I, saying this is the Lydian spin well, with Lydia Luncheon. Wait, oh, oh, hold on, I got, I got another. Oh story. Jesus Christ! Wait, 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 wait. This is a really good one. This is a really good one. Did you read about the food bank uh, that accidentally handled handed out to homeless people? Yes, meth laced candies, and yes, and uh, and, 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 and each candy was hyper about, hyper laced candies. Oh, oh, yeah, I mean, I yeah, just three hundred times the normal street dosage. The, the the street value of these things was like six hundred bucks, and probably more. And but they were giving them to homeless people because someone donated candies to the food bank, and they, and it looked like clean bootleg of some famous candy company there are these pineapple and we thought ones. razor blades and apples for halloween was a horror show so suddenly you have these it's in auckland new zealand these homeless people just bugging the fuck out like next i mean level. can we leave the homeless can we give the homeless food and shelter instead of like methamphetamine 300 times the dose that the average person would want in a single idol a, a bunch of people were hospitalized and uh Yes, and and they they think they handed out four hundred of these things. <laughs> well, you think somebody could have tested it? I mean, whatever, you know. Oh my well, god! Well, I always say when you come to Mama Lunch's kitchen, you know what you're gonna be eating: <laughs> divine DNA served <laughs> up by the goddess of cookery. And who's our guest? Is cookery? Who's, who's our guest? And this cookery. Week? And our guest this week is Jennifer Charles. Yes. The amazing. Writer, vocalist, composer, singer, poet, 
of Elysian Fields. She's fun. Here we go She's at fun. this again. As always, the Lydian Spin with Liddy Lunch, Tim Dahl, and Jennifer Jeffries. <laughs> This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and the very special Jennifer Charles, a proud, childless cat lady, writer, singer, songwriter, actor, poet, best known as one half of the New York cult band. I don't know why it's still a cult band after 14 albums, the latest one just released. What the Thunder said, the cult band Elysian feels. Hi, Jennifer. Hi. So good to be here. Well, it's good to have you. This is a this is a treat, and thanks for making time in your afternoon. Um, d- d- I mean, you're pretty conspicuous in your, the way you presented uh, your bio, saying I'm a proud childless cat lady. I mean, re- I, I guess I, I was offended. I'm not even a childless cat lady, but but what the fuck was that sure? about? Am I what? Are you sure, you're not. Uh, oh, I, well, I'm I'm pretty sure I'm I'm childless. If I'm not, well, yikes! I've offered uh, many a times <laughs> to give them a little snip, and anybody else that needs one, I'm just saying, <laughs> yes, sterilization is not a bad idea. But but what I'm getting at, I mean, I, I mean, are you? I know your art is usually not that political, or maybe it is. Do you, do you view yourself as a political person with your art? I try not to view myself so much from the outside and then judge it. I mean, sure. it is that that seems like as soon as you get into that, I mean, of course, everybody has moments of that. What's, you know, what's being projected um, and and how am I coming off, whatever. But um, I'm definitely, uh, I've definitely been on that bandwagon before that bandwagon uh, was a hit. Yeah. As far as the, I've as decades, far as the, uh, I've had <laughs> decades of rejection and projectile vomiting, my <laughs> political concept. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. Uh, what the Thunder said, the 14th album. It's beautiful. Thank you. It's beautiful. And anybody that hasn't heard you, I don't know how they couldn't have after. The many decades you, I, and Tim Dahl have been putting it out there. They need to investigate. I mean, it's not your only project and you've worked with so many people, but this new album, and also I have to say, we were both, you, me, Kramer, Ann Waldman, Thurston Moore, et cetera, on this new Edgar Allan Poe release, which we had Ann Waldman and Kramer on recently. Which I love. I'm very excited about that. And, and the side, we're on the same side. And that's my favorite side, side B. Because we're all about side B. <laughs> well, <Exactly. laughs> side, side B. So was there, were, growing up, were there any uh, 45s you possessed and were oh. like, and, and, and you're like, side B, side B is the oh, one. And, 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 <laughs> of course you had support yours, but were there ones where side, it actually tipped your belief in this kind of dogmatic view about side Bs. Were there any deep cuts that really, were formative for you? I mean, interesting question. Well, let me just start by saying that as a child, I was um, completely bedazzled by all of the early art forms, music, film, um, early stuff. I mean, I grew cave, up- Cave drawings? Cave drawings? Hell yeah, cave drawings. <laughs> Um, <laughs> those in Brooklyn, we just cave yes. drawings never go out of style. Um, <laughs> no. um, I'd you like know, to draw a I, cave and then erase them. <laughs> roar, roar. Yeah, cavemen. Um, <laughs> but you cave started in, in, the, in theater singing, I mean, very early on also, well, didn't you? I mean, yes. You well, were a, a little time thing opening your beautiful mouth. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing is I started, I probably started singing before I could even speak. And I was speaking before I was one. And, um, and I, and I, I kind of grew up um, very independently and was raised by a single mother and um, was left alone a lot. And so I would 
soothe myself with music. I you know, had one of those little transistor radios that would sleep with me in the bed and I would just go to like, that was my, some kids have their little stuffy or whatever. I had my transistor radio that I slept with. And so, you know, in this, in the seventies and the, you know, the early seventies, I mean, basically I wasn't trying to do this, but I, you know, I know all of those, all of those shitty songs and also all the good songs, but you know, it all got in there and made this giant gumbo of, you know, uh, my existence. And um, I also had a, a big influence by my grandmother's who was really um, into music. And so I would, when I would visit her, we would listen to 78. So I really know all the, you know, the early jazz stuff. I know all the songs from the twenties and thirties. I know all of the jazz age stuff, Cole Porter, Gershwin. And then of course, you know, like the Glenn Miller stuff. And, and then my dad, who I would see occasionally was a jazz DJ in the fifties. And so um, he had a radio show when a DJ was on the radio. And so radio was a big part of my life. And my mother yeah, also I, used to radio too for me. I mean, I disappeared into the radio in the yep. early 70s as a young teenager. And the music there was a lot of really good and weird and outrageous music that was top 40s, which now yep. I don't even know what top 40 is, but I know it all sucks. But it was so diverse from so the diverse. From 78 to 73. We'd be like, yeah, like you'd hear like some of the, you know, really kind of like, hello, we're just so wholesome. And then you would hear something, something else. It was just a little bit more like edgy. Rabbit. Yeah. I yeah. must come today. Ooh. Ooh, what's that? You know? You know. Well, you know, a New York radio is still pretty diverse because I drive and I, what I do is I have that scan button and it's mm -hmm. constantly changing every seven seconds. And I stop it when I hear something that interests me or something I really hate anything that just grabs some grabs me in some way. And then of course, late night AM radio, especially at night, it, it really starts traveling. I, I don't know how it works. It's, it bounces off the uh, off the tops of clouds. So, so suddenly at late at night when there's less congestion, you can pick shit up from fucking Toronto oh, or, or all over the place. Yes. I love that. I, I, I listen to radio probably most days um, and it, it can still be good, but I, I kind of remember it as as a little better, but when I first yeah, moved yeah. to New York, I was yeah, still... I remember it as a lot better. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, you know, transfigured night when I moved to New York, and I would just like lay there and that I would go to sleep to music because that was what I did when I was small. And and you know, then I got into stuff. Hey, stop that, Mochi. Sorry, my <laughs> one of my cats is eating a flower. Oh, the crazy cat ladies, crazy cat comes into the picture. E eating and flowers, together. eating yes. flowers. It, Wait, can you, sorry, one second. I'm just going to get her away from these flowers and put them somewhere. Okay. <laughs> I wonder if they're calla lilies. I have to ask what kind of flowers it's trying to eat. No, they did. Yeah. What kind of flowers was, they, was, the, was Munchie trying to eat? Does the cat have worms or something? I don't, what, don't when, they, when they eat grass and stuff, isn't that like a. Oh, gorgeous. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do you, do you buy your own flowers or or do people buy flowers for you in general? Um, both, but nice. those I, but I, those I bought. And I also like to pick flowers randomly in the Ooh. city, like, especially in public places with the city, you know, city buildings. And they've got things. I'm like, I'm going to take some clippings here and I'm going to just grow clippings from your shit. Because mm. like I they have steal flowers myself because yeah. I, Right? Are you going to arrest me for stealing funereal accoutrements? From, from, from <laughs> grave, never, ever from graveyards, Lydia? <laughs> no, I want fresh. <laughs> what I've done in the graveyard, ran out to scout today, Timothy Seymour Dolphin. No, we're not. talking. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say that then when I, like, after I knew the stuff from the 20s and 30s and stuff, um, when I was probably about six, um, I had a best friend whose mom had all these um 45s from the 50s and 60s so we would listen to a lot of fat domino elvis do the twist you know um this uh bobby's girl song where it started out you're not a kid anymore and i was like yeah i'm not a fucking kid cool <laughs> yeah nice. so, i was like i'm done with this all right, I got, I got. I'm sorry, I got to cut in because I'm just remembering a song. It was a single. Johnny get angry. Johnny get mad. Give me the biggest beating. Oh, really? 
You think you're going to beat me, motherfucker? I don't <laughs> think so. Oh, no. No, 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 no. I'm just remembering that song. Yes. <laughs> Love that, Lydia. Do you have a photographic memory? Um, Pretty much, yeah. I hear songs. All right. And, and I, I also, um, another one of my favorite games is um, to be, you know, especially uh, to entertain myself in supermarkets is to just complete the rest of the song. And my husband's like, how did you know that? You've never heard that song. I was like, because the lyrics are just so completely inane that you can uh, complete. Duh. Um, uh, yes. And yeah. Yeah. Understanding ten different languages, Miss. May I ask? Yeah. Oh, because you have and, the photographic memory. <laughs> but I do. I do remember things that I heard, and then and then later it was more of the jazz stuff because my dad, you know, had the, all the you know Charlie Parker and. Um, Chet Baker gets Chico Hamilton, Dizzy, you know, Monk and stuff like that. And I got really into that stuff. And and growing up in D.C. where I grew up, I, I heard a lot of I got to hear a lot of jazz greats. So I got to go see Peggy Lee and Ahmad Jamal and stuff like yeah. that. And um, and my mom also used to be a torch singer before I was born. So she was really, you know, this. um yeah, she would sing in French, Edith Piaf, and um, you know, kind of stuff like that. And um, and uh, she was also a programmer on a radio station for classical music, so I had that. And then then being in D.C. with the whole incredible D.C. scene of when I was growing up in the '80s. So and then you had like, you know, Ethiopian music, which was incredible that I was like I loved. And then the yes, D.C. Yeah. go scene. And of course, the punk rock scene and Bad Brains and all that stuff. And then going to see. Trouble Funk. Yes, Chuck Brown, Trouble Funk, all of that amazing stuff. <laughs> hey, so it's so, it's so insane because DC really does have that incredible history. And I guess because it's the, it's per capita has got the, out of any city, it's got the most gazillionaires, now, I think with all the lobbying and all that stuff. And I feel like it's parallel with kind of the disintegration of their, of their, their uh, music and nightlife culture, with the exception of maybe. Virginia Beach, you know, that's Timberland and all the whole Missy Ellie and hip hop, but, but that's that's not DC, right? So so but do you go back? I mean, do you do you long for those those days? Or are you kind of like fuck you, DC? I'm I'm a New York girl now. What's what's your relationship with that city? I'm just going well, weren't you just in DC? Weren't you just in DC? I mean yes. when I contacted you and broke down the church. Exactly right, Lydia. I um interestingly enough, I mean, I don't I'm not I'm not a nostalgic person. I don't I don't like go back and sit around and think about the old days. I'm just like, I'm very much, like, of the moment. I'm not even of the future. I'm just like of the now. Yeah. Um, but, um, exactly. but, um, but uh, you know, I actually did go down to DC um, this past weekend, Saturday night. I hadn't been down there since um, probably um, before my dad died and when he used to be down there and, um, and, hadn't been there and a whole group of people that I used to know um, that we all used to hang around a club. Um, one of the clubs that we hung out with hung out at was called posers. Um, so you would have <laughs> a lot of people like, you know, from um, the band B feeder and just other things and playing a lot of music from, you know, the UK and the stuff that was coming out then. Um, and, uh, just dance because I I moved out um, on my own when I was a junior in high school and I just supported myself and then I was a student by day and then I had you know two jobs and then I would just go out dancing all night and that's what I did most most nights and so they had this reunion with actually my <laughs> my first my first boyfriend my first official boyfriend. Um, was the DJ at this party. And I was like, this is going to be a trip. And some of my old friends were going down, were, were there. I still have a couple of friends that live there. Um, so I actually did that. And it was a blast. We we danced all night. <laughs> it's amazing. Cause so so few musicians, uh, seems like, really care and go out dancing a lot. 
And you um, think yeah, and I, was I, just I, I, just, I was just saying to Zora the other night that I have cut the rug with Skeleton Boy, Ryan, of <laughs> our great noise content. And she goes, where did you do that? I go, I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll dance with Skeleton Boy. Hey. Wait, wait, wait. Also, oh, well, Je- cool. well Je- Jennifer, I, I, you know, and I said this before in the podcast, Carl Heinz Stockhausen made sure he would go dancing at least once a week. He thought it was essential for, for musicians to be connected with dance, no matter what the fuck you're making. I agree with that. I, I and As a Stockhausen fan, I, I think those are brilliant words to live by. And I do, I do dance probably more than that. Um, more than once right. a week, more right. than you listen to Stockhausen at this point. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. and I like to I like to dance to all kinds of stuff. In fact, we have dance parties here, just unofficial dance parties with um for two. Um, well, and- excuse me, but I wouldn't mind being the third leg sometime. I'll be waiting. Yeah, for my <laughs> you, you've got to come over. And um, there's so many things that we could do and talk about and talk about food. And I love your your cookbook and the interjection that you made just to your cookbook is one of the best, I think, cookbook intros that ever existed. Right I now, I, I just it. reread it recently because I was just like, I just coincidentally, st- I'm starting to get on a Casanova trip because I'm going to be going to Venice for the first time. So I was like, I've got to, you know, brush up on my Shakespeare, my Casanova. So, um, going down really? that like over 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 so how how old were you with your first serious boyfriend um i was 15 okay were, were you boy like you or late bloomer <laughs> but but well, were you um well i was when i say you know i had other boyfriends before that um of course but um <laughs> yeah um how but, old were you uh, you had your first serious boyfriend, a bromance. <laughs> Me? Well. Just thought um, I'd throw it in. <laughs> I've never had like a boy. I, I I have many boyfriends, but I've never yeah. had a, I've, not, I've never had a, a homosexual uh, relationship uh, with a boy. What about but... our relationship? Oh, yeah, I forgot. I forgot. You, you... <laughs> what about you and Big Lou? <laughs> you don't, you don't have to have a relationship. Well, uh, I, I, well, that's. Fine, but I've never had homosexual experiences. But I'm um, not. I, I'm um, not. Again. You know what? I think you're, the phone's going to start ringing any minute. <laughs> I mean, were, were, Jennifer, were you boy? Were you boy crazy growing up? Do you remember uh, as a child? Or, or... Oh, oh yes, oh yes, very much so. Um, and in fact, um, another thing that besides music just being so much a, a part of me and a part of who I've always been, um, I soon realized that this is um, going to be the language that I can speak with boys because I found that they wouldn't really want to talk about other things. Oh, you know, that's I, cool. I'm like, you're not, you don't want to talk about science with me. You don't want to talk about the, the world or the meaning of life. Okay, we'll talk about this new band or this other band. And, and um, you might have been boy crazy honey but i'm sure the boys are crazy about you and they still are i don't know about that i don't know about i I took a survey before this conversation (laughs) only the best boys nine out of ten dennis surveyed say well it's it's that's kind of an uh that's an uh, interesting observation because it actually is factual uh whether we like it or not uh that um at least in the united states Boys consume more music for whatever reason than girls do. So that's an interesting intuitive or perceptive angle to enter uh, the brain world in connection with boys. And it's and, well, and as I'm, far as the girls I know, we're consuming more science, politics, and architecture. So you let's know, just I, keep no, I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm just talking about numbers. It doesn't it might not even be true, but, but numbers are like numbers. Uh uh, so all right. So you, you're getting in with boys and you're also I mean, I guess I can't imagine that was your only interest in music is, is getting into boys, but you, but you could use that tool of being in a family surrounded okay, by music. first time on the stage, Jennifer. What, what, when All was right, the first time on the stage? Well, um, I was a really shy kid, actually. And um, I, I don't know why, but um, I guess just kind of being alone a lot and especially my brother and I being alone and and so I would just make up songs by myself, 
to soothe myself or to to my jog or um and I just felt like being shy was something I needed to overcome and and so then uh, I found that the stage was a, a way for me to do that and um I started doing theater at a very young age and um you know I probably started when I I probably you know, got in a stage that that wasn't like a school play, but, you know, when I was nine and then I just continued and I started doing professional theater in D.C. Um, in those young years. And then I, I changed schools because um, the school that I was going to wasn't really hip to me leaving school for rehearsals and and all my friends were older, you know, and, uh, you know, grownups that were in theater. So that's who I was like, okay, we're going to go and we're going to go to Badlands and hang out and do poppers all night. I'm like, this is my other crowd or, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, and um, the school, like, why can't, why can't she do this test? So then I changed to um, do Gellington school where they were more permissive of um, you doing professional work in theater um, and doing plays and stuff like that. Um, but anyway, just, I, I felt that inhabiting other characters really helped me with that. And it also, um, you know, helped me with my songwriting. Um, you know, when I first started writing songs, I didn't think of it like, hey, I'm writing a song. Isn't this official? It was just like, this is like some kind of, it was more of a, this is just something I do. Like I, I wake up and I, I do this thing to soothe myself. Um, you know, I would make up funny stuff and try to make people laugh, dirty things or whatever. <laughs> Um, little spoofs, take take melodies that already existed and then change the lyrics. Did you ever do that, Lydia? Well, yes, I do it all. She the time. she still does it. She still does <laughs> it. I, yeah, of course. Um, I mean that, that's that's. But I've fun. never I've never been shy for one second in my life. I mm. don't understand what shyness is. It's I'm, but uh, shy people are often attracted, especially men. I mean, I've worked with a lot of shy guys. They're not afraid of me. It's the macho ones that are more threatened. Um, I feel that I comfort shy people. Strangely enough, I don't know. Yes, I, you do. You, you absolutely do, and you you did that for me, and. You know, the first time I discovered you, um, I felt like this is um, a kindred spirit and um, you your work has meant, meant a lot to me. I, you know, Queen of Sam, I listened to that record inside out and I just really felt empowered by you and your work and um, and just really helped so, me tap through that fearlessness and be like, nobody's going to fuck with you because I said so. <laughs> Thank you so much. We were talking the other day and you said you were working at the knitting factory when I was doing, because I did a lot of um, curatorial things, a lot of spoken word shows at the knitting factory. Yes, I saw probably saw most of them. And I saw you in D.C. at D.C. Space, like when I was younger than that, when I was in high when school. When I was hardcore, when I was hardcore, spoken word. <laughs> <laughs> it's strange. <No. laughs> so, but yeah, friends are psychopaths i mean that's just the way it is but um i'm i always you know i'm here to comfort and caress and whatever it takes to just make people feel strangely more comfortable you know a lot of people might think oh my god it makes me sound like no 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 the shyer someone is or the more introverted actually i can sometimes make them feel more comfortable that's what i want to do i want people to be more like me more like bold and and unhindered but there, there's this whole like opposites attract, it, it, which is like a natural thing. Like this person who has bad sense of direction is attracted to this person who has good sense of direction. It's, it's like nature. And um, yeah, it makes sense if, if you're a vivacious and uh, an extrovert that, that, that maybe shy people <laughs> might be attracted to you. I mean, I mean so, or, or, they're, or they're afraid of you. I, 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 there, I remember this girl in high school who was like, this be beauty, but she was so shy and like, um, and she said she, later we, we ended up being a, in a relationship for a while, she's like, "I was afraid of you," and that's why she wanted to be be, be my partner. Like, what? But whatever, that's a different. Well, story. it's a pretty, so, yeah. but but so but but tell the people that might fear me for no <laughs> no reason uh, other than they fear themselves. So, uh, Jennifer, back to you, please. Thank you. So, you're in theater. You're doing other people's. You're inhabiting different characters. 
do you still inhabit different characters in your everyday life? Does that kind of help you to get out of yourself? Because I always tell women, especially, I'm like, if you're having a problem with yourself, just pretend you're somebody else. Go into the mirror, <laughs> pull a little Betty Davis, pull a little Joan Crawford, a little Liz Taylor, little whoever. You can be whatever you want to be. You don't have to be stuck with what you think you've been contaminated by. You can be whatever you want to be. Absolutely, yes. Um, and I, um, I also think that being empathic to other people's lives um, and understanding other people, what kinds of traumas we've all been through or some people have been through, that's a good place for the writing. So um, I, you, you can't talk about things unless you really know them inside and um, whether you've experienced them yourself or you're a deep empath. So, um, you know, you, so when they're, when you are getting into somebody else's shoes, there has to be that respect and that understanding um, without judgment. As, as far as writing goes, for it, that's what, what I think for, for me. And, and the, the new album, What the Thunder Said, it's a lot about night, the comfort or the envelopment of night. A lot of it is uh, these kind of imageries and very beautiful. I mean, I wouldn't say it's a dark record. I would say it's an enveloping record. It kind of just puts you in its arms and uh, does a gentle caress. Well, thanks. I'm, I, I guess I am inspired by nature and, um, and, and, and night and uh, it's a, it's a fertile time for me when things happen in a kind of um, somnambulist lucid dreaming kind of way where you know you can bring that to have you felt affected by the recent solar flares i've had some very bizarre uh, experiences in my own house which i will just you know thank the solar flare for doing lights going on that nobody is touching lights going on that have a battery that when were they timer, not going on when posters were they? falling down behind my head I've definitely experienced stuff like that. And um, I, I want to know what you guys are talking about or what you have spoken about before the show, because I often enjoy those uh, intros where you're, uh, you know, talking about, I, I, I want to know what the, the juxtap- Well, we don't know yet because we always do the intros after we do the conversation. Yeah, we, 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 we do them on the eve of each week. I'm sure the solar flares will come into it, as well as the heat wave deaths. Yes, I was reading about the, the smallest humerus ever found in, in Indonesia. Did you guys read about that today? The, the, the smallest what? Um, humerus. It's like part of an arm. And, and they uh, these hobbit people in, in Indonesia where they found this like um, 600,000 um, year old small hobbit person parts um, in Indonesia. And, um, and they had the smaller brains and it was pretty cool. That could be a suggestion for the. Uh, I, I, I'll look into it. I, I mean, I, I have a hunch it's just going to make me infu- just furious, but uh, <laughs> no, no, I'm joking. Yeah, I'll check that out. I mean, I always, I always love it when countries fight over, like, some you know kind of mummified corpse they find somewhere. Like it's ours. It's ours. Oh, well, it's an alien. Well, it's, yeah, well, it's, wait, it's, countries didn't it's even so- exist when this fucking thing happened. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? But uh, anyhow, yeah. Um, all right. So yes, well, we're we're gonna figure out what we're gonna talk about later before oh, be, before your very show. Very soon because I am departing shortly for Europe in a couple of hours. Oh, so, really? You're flying uh, to Europe? Yeah, I thought it was tomorrow, but it's tonight. I know. I'm like I'm a, I'm ahead or behind of myself. I'm, I think I'm both at this point because I've been road dogging so much of the year. And Jennifer, you'll be going to Europe in October to support uh, when the th- what the thunder said. Is Europe, I mean, of course, it's both mine, Tim, and most everybody we know, it's our biggest audience because they're more understanding of artists. Is that, how often do you tour? What's going on in October? Where are you going? Well, um, we're going to back to France because we were just there in May and June. 
and we're going back to France, back to Switzerland, Belgium, um, I think Germany, we're going to Vienna and um, going to Prague, going to Budapest. And I, I've never played there, so I'm excited about that. Oh, it's, that's yeah. fun. That's always fun. You should like share Italy. with us your share with us your calendar when after this uh, podcast because Lydia and I are always there. I'm gonna be there in October well, too. So I'll, so, I'll, so, be, yeah. I'll yeah. be coming back. I'll be leaving uh, August 14th, and I'll be coming back September 20th. So we'll just miss each other. But no, I'll, so I'll, be, I'll be there. I'll be there in October. Yeah. How long is the tour, Jenna? Um, it's a month. So okay. um, fantastic. So that's gonna be that's gonna be really fun, and I'm looking forward to that and. You know, I just feel really grateful and um, really, really lucky that I, I, I love our audiences um, and I just wouldn't trade it for the world with any, with what, uh, you know. What and friends about. really love you. Yeah, I think that there's a, definitely a simpatico there with, the, you know, French literature and romanticism and um, sensuality that the French get. And so, and I've collaborated with um other French artists over the years too. So um that's really great. And a wonderful dance company called Aferia Stary, and that was cool to make something totally different to compose music for dance. Um, I would like to do more of that. Um, to, for you know some other other dance things. And I, recently, I've really gotten into um Buto and um this company called um called Sankai Juko. And um, I saw them last year and it just blew me away. And um, and I actually recently took a masterclass with one of the main dancers in the company and uh, was <laughs> was just going for it for three hours with this teacher. Tim, Tim works with an amazing Budo artist, Azumi, and we're doing a show in November, the three of us together. And also we've had on this Vanessa Sconce, a good friend of mine for many years, who's often mixes buto and sometimes with voodoo dancing, which is and does Ooh. music, and it's really fantastic. So that's a very because buto is really. We'll done. invite you to because Lydia and I are doing a a, a performance with Azumi Oe, who's incredible, like almost a master. I, it was I forget which company she was with, but for fifteen years or something. Anyhow, but we'll invite you to our our show with that. Let me ask you uh, not to go backwards because you're such a person living in the present uh but when did you move to new york and and what was kind of like your first like wait i'm gonna this is what i'm gonna do yeah um well i moved to new york in 1987 and um i i guess it's really the way my personality and the way i grew up i just never felt like I'm going to do or like I'm at like I'm an achiever or something like that. I, I was just like, this is what I this is what I am. It was more like this is how yeah. it's gonna come out because this is who I am and you know the rest will will tell me what it wants to be. And I didn't know necessarily that I would um be fortunate enough to make my living as a, a musician or an, an artist or um I, I don't like to think about that stuff. Uh, <laughs> it's just kind of creepy to me. Um, and I, I just kind of trust the universe to just like, okay, I'm going to do me and all the stuff that makes me excited. Um, and sorry, <laughs> there's mochi. <laughs> oh, <laughs> my favorite kind of tiger cat. Yeah. A picture. <laughs> Uh, well, you but, um, in, in, seven, but in, then you worked with a lot of like, hot, you know, notorious New York musicians, John Lurie, Mark Rebo, I mean, Thurwell, James Chance, I mean, so many people. And I guess, so did you come and just begin with Legion Fields or what, how, what, what, what'd you do? You I, got here. I, have, I had been in other bands, nothing, nothing good, nothing, um, <laughs> just, uh, you know, bands that just rehearsed. <laughs> and never did anything. Um, and then, then I met Oren in 1990, Oren Blodow, and I I'd been working at the Knitting Factory, and you know at that time I'd already you know when I was in high school I I was really into you know 
the lounge lizards and New York scene. I was into everything. And that that's always kind of been me. It's not just into one thing. I'm not just like, I'm just like this hardcore person. I'm just this reggae person or whatever. I would I would just I want to I want to eat everything that's good. I'm in the Duke Ellington school. Right? There's really only two kinds of music, good and bad. And you know, I used to go to um, London all the time when I was in high school, and just like, okay, I can go there for. I mean, I remember tickets being like you could go there for seventy five bucks or a hundred bucks, and just be like, I'm going to go do this and be um, an adventurer and go to shows and listen to music and uh and have have art adventures in 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 film were there any great really shows in london that you saw that really stood out um, what year was that that was in the mid 80s i mean none that super stood out but they were fun nonetheless but there i actually did see the first um I mean, it's it stood out in that it's more of a like, oh, wow, you saw that. It wasn't I was trying to do it. I, um, but I actually did see the first Red Hot Chili Peppers, <laughs> um, their UK debut, their very first show in London, where it was just in this small bar where they were doing the socks on their cocks and and whatnot. And and so anything for attention <laughs> when you don't have any mm -hmm. musical talent. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but was it was, was no? Was that Cliff Martinez on, on drums? Do you remember who was on drums? Because that's that's. Uh, I wonder. I think so. Okay. So it was like what? What year was that? Like so that was probably like eighty five. It might have been him, or he might have just left. Uh, who knows? Um, but hey, it doesn't matter. I mean, Lydia um, and Cliff go way back, job. but. Yeah. Um. And 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 then so moving to New York, I was you know, and I would go see the Lounge Lizards a lot, and I loved the Lounge Lizards. And um, and then Oren was in the Lounge Lizards, and when John John and I got to know each other, and um, when he said, um, "Do you know of any good bassists?" I was like, "Well, actually, there's this kid I heard, you know, just really casually named Oren Blodow, who's a bass player. You should get him." And so Oren got in the band, um, but. Then and and then, Orin and I, um, I guess he just he heard me singing, um, and yeah, he said, <laughs> well, when I was working at the Nick Factory, I was sweeping up. I was sweeping, and I was singing, um, uh, "I want to be loved by you." I think, and I just looked at him, and 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 then we we're off to the races, and um, <laughs> and. Um, so that was kind of the beginning of our relationship. It started as a relationship. And then um, we started doing music. And uh, because before that, before I met him, I was actually doing some jazz stuff in New York, um, singing old you know, jazz. I, when I was a teenager, one of my jobs, because I had so many jobs, was working in a super seedy piano bar where I had to wear one of those Playboy bow tie thing for this crazy mm -hmm. owner named uh Lou Dante and um and it was very like Dante's Inferno his name was <laughs> Lou and there was a girl that named Angel who worked there that disappeared it was it Ooh. was her, yeah all kinds of crazy things and we had our regulars and and the woman that played the piano had a giant beehive and was out of you know a, a Lynch movie with a giant, one of those giant snifters on the piano where people would put in the, the money and the tips and, you know, old men would come and say, here, would you sing a song in French? And, and, uh, <laughs> um, so that was some of my early music stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and you're and like, I gotta go downtown. This is enough with this, with the bow tie. Yes. I gotta get a bow tie. Yes. And then, and then working at the knitting factory, you know, I basically met everybody, you know, Sun Ross, Sunny Chirac, you know, we see you, I'd see, you know, JGT and, you know, of course, Zorn and all those people and, and a lot of those people that, um, that became just like our colleagues and, and whatnot. And so when we made our very first Elysian Fields EP, John plays harmonica on one of the songs, um, Rebo plays guitar on another song. 
Um, and Elysian Fields has always been kind of a collective where, you know, and Orin and I write the songs and then we see who we want to play with. Because a lot of times we like to change it up and do different things. So, uh, and, and so, all right. So, very cool. How, how did uh, how did Lovage start? Lovage started. So Lovage is a project that consists of a guy named Dan the Automator and another man named Mike Patton. And another um, man named Mike Patton. And another man named Mike Patton. Um, they Mike Patton. <laughs> so uh, somebody that I was working with at the time said, because uh, they didn't know how to contact me, I guess, and it was before maybe internet, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, and somebody knew somebody and he said, oh, Dan the Automator wants to get in touch. And I'm like, who, who's that? Because <laughs> basically there's a lot of pop culture that I just miss. Uh, Cause I'm just not, I, I'm not like finger on the pulse. Um, and, um, and I actually hadn't heard of Mike either. Um, and um, so uh, he sent me these tracks and um, the first time I heard a track, I was just like, okay, I've got something for that. Boom. And, and um, I'm like, this is, this, this could be fun. And then we just did it. And then I went to San Francisco and, um, and, you know, wrote the rest of the record. And so, you know, Mike wrote his songs and I wrote my songs. And I think there was a one, one song that we wrote together um, over Dan's beats. And then we had a tour and that was, that was the history of Lovage. Okay. The end. Right. The end. All right. Moving on. So, um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> I want to go back I mean, to the 10 languages that you can sing in. So with your photographic memory, I mean, when did you first say, I mean, you had mentioned Ethiopian music earlier on, but when did you, and, and of course, French, Chantouze, what language did you first decide, okay, I want to sing and that was it French? And then how did you go on to developing the capacity for other languages? And what languages are those, by the way? Um, let's see, what languages are those? Um, well, I guess it started off... Um, when I was small, um, evidently, um, I also started speaking English in a, with a Spanish accent. And so we'd be like, uh, because um, I kind of had a surrogate mother with this woman named Adela who watched us and lived at our house, my brother and I, while my mom went to work every day. and. So I would just do, I would speak like she spoke and um, and say, I would like so these groceries, please. Could I have this chocolate? And please, mommy, I want the chocolate. And, um, and so mm. I would start talking like that when I was young, just hearing things. For me, language has always been like music. It's just sounds that you hear and you just compute them in that, you know, little crazy computer the same way that you do music and you hear things like and so um and then um, uh, I continued with Spanish my my best friend since third grade was um half Spanish and so we would go to Spain when um when we were young and be las americanas in this very small town and everybody would go S -s -s -s, and all the boys would make these little things and we would we would do dirty dances as little lolitas when we were 11 and do all kinds of other <laughs> naughty lolita things in small spanish towns and do flamenco dancing and stuff like that um and, and we would just be on our own i mean back then just everybody was just you know on your own <laughs> and just do, just doing life um <laughs> Um, and then, um, and then um, jumping ahead, jumping ahead, and so I would sing. You know, then I would also listen to opera um, because my mom liked to listen to a lot of opera, and so hearing people singing in different languages. And um, and then um, Zorn was asking us if we mm. wanted to um, do something. And we started this other project called La Mar in Fortuna, 
where we did um, where we did the music of the Sephardic diaspora. And so we did a lot of research um, trying to find from um, you know, from the 11th to the 14th century and songs that had been, um, you know, of course, mostly passed on from oral tradition. Oral tradition, so, yeah. And I wanted to really get away from the more some of this liturgical sounding stuff um, or like, you know, just get it sounding less early music and making it more like, you know, what would, you know, the street, what would somebody in the street really make it be like and give it more duende and more life. So, so that's almost like a, per, a period piece actor would approach something like this because especially with the oral tradition music like that, there's just, you're, you're feeling it somehow, but it's, it's well, if it wasn't a lot of it wasn't even written down, I, I don't know what specifically what you were. So we, we, we picked the, you know, we, we found um, songs that we wanted to do and then we, you know, created them in the kind of maybe more Elysian field style, but um, uh, you know, we have, you know, I guess I'm singing in, in Spanish, I'm singing in Ladino, which was the the, la the language of the, the Sephardim, and um, singing in Arabic, and then a couple of different uh, different uh, dialects of Arabic, like, uh, you know, a Jewish Iraqi dialect, and then singing in Greek, because, you know, after the Inquisition, a lot of people would go to Greece as well. Um, and um, I've sung in Polish, what I've sung in Russian, I actually, that was the, that's the most recent language that I've sung in. It wasn't for La Mar Fortuna, but it was for a Russian festival. <laughs> and, um, and and I sang in Russian. So I've got, um, yeah. So well, well, Jennifer, I mean, I mean, going not to go back to Stockhausen again, but he says the sign of a, a talented and a really talented musician, it's nothing to do with uh, metric time or um, perfect pitch. It's it's based on uh, impersonation and and being able to really mimic and hear the sounds. So, based on his rules, sounds like you're just a natural. <laughs> well, no, I would just I, I, I do agree with you know ear training and um. And, oh, that's uh, not contrary to that. It's not contrary to that. But yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I I absolutely you know if somebody says. Oh, could you teach me how to sing? I'm like, I don't, I don't know that I could, but I, I would just give you the advice to just, you know, put on his Stevie Wonder record and do every little thing that he's doing, and just do that, and and listen to, you know, an Archie Shep record and 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 sing the solo on, you know, fire music. Do you know, get your ear trained to hearing all of the um all the different shapes. Stevie Wonder your superstition and living in the city. Mm -hmm. I mean. Absolutely stellar. Jennifer, did you ever hear the uh, Archie Shep Whitney Houston collaboration with Material? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that I have. Yeah, Some... it's weird. Yeah, yeah, it's it's like this kind of like. I don't know that I want to. It's kind of like this housewife <laughs> ballad, and then Archie Shep comes in with a solo, which is he's tuned a quarter tone off. It's so bizarre. But uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I actually, so I, I don't. I... Amazing. <laughs> I, 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 I'm actually into it, actually. But anyhow. Well, Tim Doll's <laughs> taste is all across what's, the cheese. What's wrong with that? All right. Nothing. No, it's good. It's good. Well, so and let me... Yeah, please. Going back, going, back, going back to jazz and being around so much jazz growing up. And of course, you said you're from... You might This might already answer the question I'm about to get, ask. You're from the Duke Ellington School. You're, there's either... There's two styles of music, good and bad. But... Do mm -hmm. you have a preference of any era of jazz? Because I mean, jazz, the, the the margins are so wide. Like, what is jazz? I, I mean, is there a, a period that just kind of grabs you the most? I mean, it's kind of like um, I I don't know that I I would say that now because I feel like when when certain music enters our lives, that's what we need. Then, like, there was a period mm -hmm. where it's just like I'm just listening to Coltrane and like. I can't really, I, I, it's not, I haven't really put on a Coltrane record recently. Right. Um, I, but, you know, but, you know, other times, I, you know, I'd be like, okay, I just want to listen to cool jazz or, you know, uh, West Coast stuff. Um, I, but then I, you know, I really can get into Bob. I can get into avant-garde shit, Albert Eiler. You know, I just need to do whatever um, I'm needing to eat. It's just like, I don't eat the same thing every day. Right. I want to have a varied diet. Um, 
and I, I like to eat all of it um, at different various times. It's just like same with, you know, style, but, um, you know, but, oh, and I, I also didn't really say that much about, um, about soul, because that was also very important to me. Like when we were talking about radio earlier, I was just thinking about also how watching TV when I was young, like mm. Soul Train, I would watch that all the time. And I remember like the first time, um, you know, I mean, a lot of the stuff and I, of course I would dance along and, you know, seeing Barry White or Curtis Mayfield on there, I was like, yeah, I'm really into this. And, and but when David Bowie came on, I'll never forget and did fame. I was just like, oh my God, I'm in love. I mean, I'm, I'm a child, but I'm feeling things that I, I don't know. <laughs> what's happening to me i'm gonna um, say in that period gladys knight and the pimps and it's only this song oh, i really got to use my imagination i'm obsessed yeah. with that song. oh yeah yeah it's really great it's such yes. a great song and it's dark but yeah. also i don't know why it's coming to mind but bill withers who um oh, he, was I love stutterer. he was a stutterer and that's why a lot of his songs have like i know i know i know mm. i know i like a hundred times i gotta leave the young thing alone Ain't no sunshine. She's yeah, so I'm very obsessed with the Bill Withers school oh. of repetition. Well, you know, you know, it's also besides a great ba besides a great bass player, also a great singer whose birthday it is today. Larry Graham from Gra Graham Central Station, Sly and the Family Stone, and I, I, of course, you know, it's like Prince's hero. But to play those those bass lines and to sing the you know contrapuntal those the, the, the melodies at the same time, I mean yikes beyond beyond but yeah graham central station uh god i suddenly want to have a, 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 a new a new love I, for I'm that getting, band getting, never, getting, they never really made it so i'm unique. getting itchy i, I want to have a little dance right now i'm, I'm getting oh, like yeah. i'm getting pants in my pants and i'm not even wearing pants are you into, <laughs> are, are you into hip-hop and rap i am i am in fact uh very much so um uh especially southern like because well as it happens, my, um, I, I'm not one of those people that say partners, but I guess, should I say partner? My husband, um, Lance. I don't um, want you, what you want. Um, <laughs> partners, like for me, do -si do um, Grab your partner, do -si do So we do do some do -si do My husband, Lance, um, has written uh, three books on, Houston hip hop, and so oh, it's really cool. all this. Uh, Starface uh, is one of my favorites. Yeah, uh, Diary of a Madman. Uh, yeah, also Face Mob, and also my homies. Thank you very much. I interviewed him once. Finn Wooden. For well, wait, 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 I, I, I wonder if he. I assume he talks about Viper, which is like the folk art uh, rapper from Houston. I, Viper. Well, it doesn't matter. Starface recently <laughs> did Tiny Desk Tape on our and NPR, and it was. I saw that. Rich. I saw the Starface um, Tiny Desk, and I thought it was fucking amazing. I loved it Had so much. It. Had to so great. Unfortunately, I would, I would Starface love to work with him. Neither of us, Jennifer. Starface is about that tall. But his gun is big, let's face it. <laughs> I love uh, Diet of the Mad Man. And my yeah. homies at uh, Face I love Mob. Devin the Dude, Devin the Dude as well. Um, and did, you, I, did your husband ever drink syrup to kind of really get into the culture? <laughs> he <laughs> has, he has. He yeah, has. All right, cool, cool. Um, you know, uh, um, and he wrote a book about DJ Screw as well. He wrote the uh, the biography of DJ Screw. Um so he's a very important hip hop uh, person that is no longer alive. Um, anyway, I do like that slowed down stuff. The screwed, screwed. You like the Jeep? <laughs> yeah, I like it. I like it. I like it. I like it slow. I like it slow and. I like um, it murderous. <laughs> and I'm I into do the murder rap. I also like Kendrick Lamar. I um, uh, not a, a Houston person, but um. But I'm really thinking about other people that I would, if I would ever do something creatively with. I like. I really think that Kendrick Lamar is interesting. Um, I'd give the thirty seventh sword to the Wu Tang Clan. <laughs> Whoops! Just saying. Sexy Red's on tour. I don't know if you checked her out. That's <laughs> that's something else. But She's I gotta Saint, bring up the Saint Louis. <laughs> Female rapper that had the most gunfire, whatever, on any record called Bop, 
boss that was on Def Jam, one album, uh, f- top song, I don't give a fuck, I don't give a fuck, I don't give a single solitary fuck, motherfucker, I'm not giving a fuck. Uh, Got to recommend boss, one album, had kidney problems, dropped out of rap, college graduate, just saying Def Jam, one album. Okay, I'll boss, check it out. I don't give a fuck. Do you get, <laughs> well, how many fucks do you want to give, Jennifer? I don't know why Big Lou is suddenly taken up. You talk about Scarface, <laughs> suddenly I get, you know, ninth ward, whatever. Even my body. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. You, I've asked this question before. Were you ever terrified at a show because of the performance? Not because of the performance, no. Um, I think the most I ever was terrified really was when I was got kind of trampled. Um, I think it might have been a UK sub show that where I was kind of, I got trampled underneath the stage and I was like, am I going to be trampled? Um, am I going to be trampled? Um, I like my boots came off. I, and I'm like, but somehow I, I slid underneath the stage and, and then I was safe there. Um, um, uh, um, it would be a tragedy to die at a UK sub show ter- by being trampled. That's terrified. I mean, I like to be terrified a little bit in a good way especially if I feel like somebody's um, can be super present. I mean, that's the best kind of terrified to be if somebody's being um, really, really present and it's just like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to have you, I'm going to have you now. And we're, we're doing this. Um, that's the most exciting thing. And, you know, all the best um, performers have that, you know, Bowie had it just like, you know, uh, and, Seeing, yeah, uh, what's his name? The guy who went cuckoo uh, <laughs> from PIL. Um, Johnny Lydon? Johnny yeah, Lydon? <laughs> before he before went cuckoo. Became a clown. Yes, yes, before he came to Clown Town. Um, <laughs> just like what, a, what, a, what an incredible um, person on stage and, and a musician, uh, right? <laughs> so, yes, yes. Um, so uh, I, I like it when somebody's very present. And to me, that's the most exciting thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, if you're, perform- if you're performing, you better be present. Why are you fucking performing? I mean, it, it, I mean, it's part of the addictive nature, I find, if you're performing all the time, it's, 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 it touches the primal of hyper-presence and, and existence. And uh, the past and the future maybe don't matter at that point. They don't. So. There's just been another sur- another study on the uh, brains of jazz guitar players, especially improvisational jazz guitar. And of course, the brain functions differently when you're really in in the moment in improv because everything else falls away, which is what sh- which is what performance and art should do is help you in that moment, whether you're doing it or listening to it, have everything else fall away. So that you're in that zone, in that moment, and the performers, their brain is, and you know this, Tim, because you're an improv master, the brain functions differently because it's not on automatic pilot, it's on something else, it's on automatic presence. And with that, I would just say, we're all in the moment when we perform. And this moment, sadly, is coming to a wonderful end because this is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch. Tim Dahl and the lovely and beautifully vocal singer, songwriter, poet, crazy cat lady, Jennifer Charles. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. So this is great.